Calling all kid singers, calling all kid singers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and Letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation. Okay, so what are we studying right now? We are looking at who in the New Testament? Great men or women? Great women. Good. Yep, that's right. Great women of the New Testament. So I've added a couple more today. So let's see if we can remember the ones we've got. Uh, and we've heard and add a couple more. Here we go. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Remember? Remember? All right. When I say Mary, a mother of Jesus, you guys say troubled but trusting. T but T. Troubled but trusting. What was she troubled at? What'd you say? Okay, she would end up being troubled at that as well. You're right. And early on, she was also troubled at what? What big message did, was she told? That she would what? That she, I can't hear everybody, I'm sorry. That she would have, that her son would be the son of God, right? So she, she's troubled at that moment, but she also trusts God, all right? Troubled but trusting. Mary, mother of Jesus, troubled but trusting. Because she, well, we already said it right there. All right, Mary of Magdala, or Mary Magdalene. When I say Mary of Magdala, you guys say? Saw Jesus first, good. At what time? At Jesus' resurrection, all right? So when Jesus was raised from the dead, all right, so let's rewind. Mary, mother of Jesus, troubled but trusting. Mary of Magdala saw Jesus first. All right, let's sing the 12 tribes of Israel. Leah, Rachel, Bill, Hazel, Pafor, wives of Israel. They helped Jacob to bear twelve sons. Dinah was the only girl. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Jephthah, twelve sons of Israel. Okay. Salome. Salome. All right. Who was Salome? Anybody remember? She's going to be the wife of. I didn't hear. Zebedee, good job, yep. Uh, she's the mother of the sons of thunder, all right? So what about her? Something to do with the table. What do we know about Salome? Right, they were seated on the right and the left. We say prideful mom. Salome, prideful mom. Rewind. Mary, mother of Jesus, troubled but trusting. Mary of Magdala saw Jesus first. Salome, prideful mom, okay? She loved her boys, didn't she? She just uh, got a little bit prideful and wanted them to have a special so a seat at the table with Jesus, the Son of God. Martha of Bethany. All right, this is the sister of Mary and Lazarus. Martha of Bethany. What was, what was she? Distracted by serving. All right, let's rewind. We're getting these down today. Mary, mother of Jesus, troubled but trusting. Mary of Magdala saw Jesus first. Salome, prideful mom. Mary of Bethany, distracted by serving. All right. Then we're going to talk about 
Mary of Bethany, her sister. Okay? Mary of Bethany, what did she do? Yeah, she listened. She heard the word. All right? Everybody? Mary of Bethany heard the word. All right, let's rewind. Getting them down one at a time today. Mary, mother of Jesus, troubled but trusting. Mary of Magdala saw Jesus first. Salome, prideful mom. Martha of Bethany, distracted by serving. Mary of Bethany heard the word. All right, which would you rather be like? On that occasion, should we want to be serving God? Well, yes, but on that occasion, Jesus was only there for a period of time, right? So it was more, very, very important that you hear the word of Jesus taught. Wife of Pontius Pilate. Now, Pilate, you guys might remember Pilate. Pilate ended up being the governor who was in charge of Jesus dying on the cross. And the Jews, the leaders of the Jews came to him and they said, we want him crucified but he said, I don't see anything wrong with this man. And they said, crucify him, crucify him. And then in the midst of all of that, the wife of Pontius Pilate. What do we remember her for? Warned Pilate. Because she saw that there wasn't anything wrong with Jesus. Jesus was a good man. He was faithful to God. He had no sin. So everybody, wife of Pontius Pilate warned Pilate. All right, rewind. Mary, mother of Jesus, tr troubled but trusting. Mary of Magdala saw Jesus first. Salome. Martha of Bethany, distracted by serving. Mary of Bethany heard the word. Wife of Pontius Pilate warned Pilate. Good. The B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I read and learn and then obey. The B-I-B-L-E. This was a new one last week. Dorcas, whose name also was Tabitha. What do we remember for her? When I say Dorcas or Tabitha, you say generous. Because she... Gave, what was that garment called? A tunic. Good job. So she, she made clothing. She was very, very talented. And she made clothing and didn't even make people pay for it sometimes. Because she cared so much about other people, especially Christians. And so when she died, all the widows were really sad, including Peter, was also very sad because she died and she had been such a generous person. And so what did Peter end up doing by the power of God? What did she end up, did she, did she stay dead? No, what happened? She, good job, she came back to life, didn't she? Good job, all right? So when I say Dorcas or Tabitha, you say generous. Dorcas or Tabitha? All right, two more. Priscilla, she's the wife of, does anybody know? Aquila, and in the New Testament, Whose name often comes first Aqu in Aquila and Priscilla or Priscilla and Aquila? Which one's usually first? Priscilla's name is usually first. Isn't that interesting? It says something about her influence, doesn't it? For her name to come before her husband's name. So Priscilla, when we say her, we're going to say teacher. Because she taught Apollos uh, the way of the Lord more perfectly. And so she was a teacher of God's word. So everybody, Priscilla, teacher. Priscilla, Teacher, Priscilla, teacher, and finally, Lydia. Oops, that should say Lydia. And Lydia was a seller of purple, so she also is involved in the garment industry, so she was a businesswoman. But when we say Priscilla, I'm sorry, excuse me, when we say Lydia, excuse me, we're going to say supporter of preaching. Lydia, supporter of preaching. Lydia, supporter of preaching. All right, let's rewind real quick. And Mary, mother of Jesus, troubled but trusting. Mary of Magdala saw Jesus first. Salome, prideful mom. Martha of Bethany, distracted by serving. Mary of Bethany heard the word. Wife of Pontius Pilate warned Pilate. 
Dorcas or Tabitha? Generous. Priscilla, teacher. And Lydia, supporter of preaching. All right. What is true success? Living your life and going to heaven. What is true failure? Living your life and not going to heaven. And what is God's plan for marriage? One man and one woman for life. And when I grow up, I want to marry a Christian. Christian. <laughs> Let's sing Galatians 2.20 and we'll go back to our seats and get ready for questions and answers. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Good evening. We begin our worship this evening with number 77, Anywhere with Jesus. Let's sing. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him dearest joys would faint. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over drearest ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea, telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Ready as he summons me to go or stay, Anywhere with Jesus when he points the way. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. The song before our prayer this evening will be number 13. Number 13. We'll sing the first and last. Let's see. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth Yeah. 
this our hymn of grateful praise. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before thee as humbly as we know how at this time. We come before thee with thankful hearts, thankful for this day which you've given us, thankful for the time we was able to come together and worship thee, and we're thankful for this hour that we have now that we're able to assemble and worship again. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that our worship today and tonight will be pleasing in thy sight. And also, dear Heavenly Father, we come before thee now praying for all those who are sick and are suffering. We ask you just be with them and with the doctors and nurses. And dear Heavenly Father, we ask for you to uh, be with those who are spiritually sick that has chosen not to be here uh, on their own will. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you just give us the right words and attitude that we can encourage these people. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask you to be with us. We ask all these things in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. The song of invitation will be number 424 following our, uh, our invitation this evening. Before that, if you would stand and we'll sing number 715. 715. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous! Tonight is questions and answers night. I have one topical question, and then my second question this evening will be 
on a passage of scripture. The topical question is this, should Christians contribute to the Salvation Army's Red Kettle Campaign? What I would like to do first is talk about the Salvation Army. And as we look at this, many of you may not know this, it is a denomination. The Salvation Army is a denomination. It was started in London in 1865, and it was called actually the London Christian Mission, after which it was changed to the Salvation Army in 1878. This denomination was started, was founded by a man by the name of William Booth. So first off, we see that it is a man-made religion started by someone other than our Lord at the wrong time, 1865, and also in the wrong place, not Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, but in, but in London, England. Now, what I want us to take note of is the organization of this. In no way does this denomination in the faintest resemble the church that we read about in the pages of the New Testament. In no way. As we look at this, I want you to take note of some things. The international headquarters, and you heard that right, the international headquarters of the Salvation Army is in London and is under the authority of the International General. The General operates through a chief of staff into various overseas departments where limited administrative decisions are made. In the United States, the army is divided into four different territories with headquarters in New York, in Chicago, in Atlanta, and in San Francisco. Now we'll get to San Francisco in just a minute, but I hurriedly want to go through some things considering that it is a denomination started by man. There is a headquarters, there are territories, there is a general, there is a chief of staff of which you will not read any of pertaining to the church that we read about in the pages of the New Testament. As we continue on, their doctrine of salvation is very blunt and simple. They believe in faith only. It is grace through faith, but at the point of belief, one is saved. That is contrary to the will of God. They believe in total hereditary depravity, which is Calvinism. That is the very first point, bullet point, if you will, of Calvinism. They state that we inherit Adam and Eve's sin. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, the Bible says, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be in, upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. They believe in the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they also make mention of Romans 1.16. It is not through the gospel, but it is by the direct operation of the Holy Spirit one is saved. They deny baptism as essential to salvation, which we know the Bible firmly stands and teaches. Acts 2.38, Mark 16.16. 16. 1 Peter 3.21, among other passages of Scripture. The Lord's Supper is excluded. They do not partake of the Lord's Supper, at least on a regular basis. Instrumental music has been introduced into their worship, which is not authorized in the pages of the New Testament. They, they have brought in women preachers. And unscriptural financing. Now, this is where San Francisco comes in, and I do not know at this time where Atlanta lies, but in San Francisco, if you are a charitable donator and you are an organization in many congregations, even of the Lord's Church, for tax purposes and for IRS purposes, consider themselves nonprofit organizations. Now, what San Francisco has done is said you can receive. $3.5 million up to that. .5, that. That's a lot, up to $3.5 million if you're a charitable organization, but you can't exclude some people. You can't exclude those that live together outside the marriage fold. Those that are shacking up, you cannot exclude 
in your service, in your benefits, in whatever you offer. You cannot exclude those who are living in a homosexual relationship. For a while, they didn't take this money. The Salvation Army didn't. But you know what they ended up doing? It was such a great amount of money, they ended up taking it in San Francisco. No, I do not know about the others. Now, that's a little bit about the Salvation Army. It is a man-made religion that is foreign to the will and the word of God. Now, should we give money to them? Because somebody says, well, they do a lot of good. The person asking the question says this. One asked because the church leader, not here at Jacksonville, but a, an elder, is what the way I'm reading this, once said he donated every time he saw a kettle because when he was injured during the war, only the Salvation Army provided care to him and other injured soldiers um, in the hospital. Now, here's my answer to this. In short, no. I would not donate to them. We really don't know where the money goes. If they have a headquarters, if they have a chief of staff, what are they doing with that money? Now, some of it may be going to charitable deeds, but do the, men, do the ends justify the means? When we look at this, and this man said, when I was in the hospital, they were the only ones, and, but now he's an elder, here's an idea. If you're an elder, start a work. Start a work at the congregation where you are a shepherd to help soldiers, to be a shining light. Maybe be able to even open up a door of possibility to study with soldiers. Start some kind of work for those that, that you feel for because you were once there. But should we give to them? No, we should not because that's giving to a denomination, a man-made religion. My first question is really related to young people especially, uh, but you could apply this to an employment situation. If I don't understand a concept for an assignment, why isn't it okay to copy work from another student, All right? In other words, we call that cheating, and that automatically doesn't sound good, right? I like that this question assumes that it's not okay to copy other people's work, but there are some situations, and I see this as a teacher, I see generally Christian professing young people um, who, uh, who participate in this. And so I think that they begin to justify it somehow. There are some situations where students or even employees find themselves compromising their values. Plagiarism, I don't know if you know this, but plagiarism is actually a somewhat modern phenomenon. It used to be the case that uh, in a lot of circles worldwide to imitate someone else's work or to even recite or quote or, or say something that someone else initially coined was not a faux pas. It wasn't something bad to do. Um, but it gained steam with the printing press when you could lose money on your own work by other people copying it. Uh, then it became an issue. Later with the advent of the internet, amp that amplified people's access to others' work. And then today, the use of AI technology brings even more concerns about the subject of using other people's ideas. So back to students. Students and employees can be tempted to copy other people's work easily when, one of three reasons, they don't understand how to do an assigned task, or when they don't have enough time to complete it to fidelity, or when someone, often a well-meaning friend, is willingly volunteering to give you their work to copy. And it is my suggestion to you that in all three of those instances, a Christian young person or older person would be violating God's will if we do that. There are a few important Christian principles we can connect to this question. Number one, Christians, uh, rather, number one, copying work is equivalent to lying. Let's pretend you think, you think that it's okay. Ask yourself this question. Could you turn in that copied work 
and tell your teacher as you turn it in that you copied it from a friend. If you could say that honestly, then maybe you're okay. But 99 plus percent of us would know that that is violating our own ethics. And it's violating not only uh, school ethics, but also Christian ethics. You know you're wrong if you could not say that. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 13 says, You shall not cheat your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you, and all, with you all night until morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says, If anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Christians should be concerned about the rules of what is fair in an academic situation, in a professional situation, and in this present world. In Ephesians 4 and verse 25, Paul says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And finally, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 21 says, Providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. If you are deceiving others by claiming your work is authentic, then you're also seeking to, to deceive God. The second principle is Christians should respect the principle of sowing and reaping. If you try to turn in copied work as if it's your own and you think that's okay, you are bypassing God's law of, so of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6 verses 6 through 8 says, Let him who has taught the word share in all things with him who teaches. Do, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will, will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So it's important to sow so that we can reap. We should not expect to reap without sowing. God made mankind to be workers. You see that he left the natural, natural world for us to observe our place in it beginning with the ants who worked hard together in Proverbs 30 and verse 25, and the roaring lion who is compared to Satan who ceaselessly walks to and fro on this earth because it's his nature. We too should be workers like we see in the animal kingdom. He told Adam to have dominion over every living thing in Genesis chapter 1, and after man's fall, he said in Genesis 3 and verse 19, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Christians are expected to work. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10 teaches, If any will not work, neither shall he eat. No grades for no work. And no grades for you if it's someone else's work. Christians, thirdly, are expected to do their best. We're to work for others like we're working for Jesus. And that's taught directly by Paul in Colossians 3 and verse 23. Would we claim authentic work if we were handing in work to Jesus and yet it was work that was copy copied? Surely not. We know that he would know truth, and therefore we should not deceive others knowing that they're not Jesus, because we should live our lives serving others like we serve him. What can a Christian student or employee do then? Instead of giving in to the temptation to copy another's work, if it's because you don't know how to do something, ask for help, ask for remediation, and or take an unwanted grade and handle your responsibility to learn and grow from it. You'll be respected more for taking a failing grade by your peers and your teacher than to take a faked grade. Also, instead of giving in to the temptation to copy another's work, if it's because you don't have enough time to complete a task, ask for more time. Or ask what you should do, given your limited time. Or again, take the failing grade and accept your responsibility to learn and grow from it. And thirdly, instead of giving in to the temptation to copy another's work, if it's because you're too proud to admit weakness, then take the poor grade and handle your responsibility to learn and grow from it and confess your fault of pride with someone who can pray with you and help you on that and grow. This is the hardest of the two questions I have this evening. If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and bear with me, I have questions of my own. I'm going to deal with one aspect of this question, and I'm going to hold off on the other because I have questions of my own that I'm, I'm trying to, to work through. 
As we look at Luke chapter 16, let's begin with verse 1. And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord commended, the Lord commended, the unjust steward for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. I'm going to stop there. The question is this, why does it seem he was commended for his actions? First of all, what I want us to take look of or take note of is who's being spoken to. You know, when you look at the first verse, it just says, and he said unto his disciples, it's not speaking necessarily of just the 12. What I want you to do is look at the context. You have to go all the way back to Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Here's his followers. Here's his disciples that's being spoken of. Okay? And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them. Then he spoke the parable of the prodigal son unto them a little bit later on. And now we come to Luke 16, the same crowd and the same people are present. You have the publicans and sinners. And publicans, remember, were those men that were Jewish tax collectors, somewhat stewards. They were those that, that would make gain. And it appears, if you look at the parable, that this man was cheating his master out of his gain. You owe my master how much? Well, then take this off. What I have found in this is this concerning this aspect, and this is where I am on this so far. In archaeology, there have been found some evidences and, and some scrolls and some other things showing and telling the dealings of stewards in the first century. Here's what's interesting. Today, a man that is a boss, okay, someone who is a, a manager, and he hires someone to take care of his affairs, he pays him for his services. And that man takes care of his business. But not necessarily so from one source that I found. Here's how it would work. The steward, for instance, would go and apparently this, this lord was renting out properties for, olive, for olives, for wheat. And here's the set price what would be included in that price that was owed to the Lord would also include the services for the steward. The steward would add what his price was in with that one bill. And then when that bill was due, he would go and he'd say, I need the bill, the bill is due, you pay. And they would pay him a hundred. Well, what the steward would do, he would say, okay, it was actually 50, but the person wouldn't know that. Only the steward would know that. I'm going to make it 100. I'm taking 50. And my Lord is taking 50. Okay? I believe what's going on here, and as well as the source that I looked at, 
this man was commended because he was taking and lowering his part out of it or depleting his part to make things right before he left so that everything would be good and someone else would hire him and bring him into his house as a steward. He was commended for doing that which was right, not doing that which was wrong. He was taking and lowering his part or depleting it altogether and only charging what the Lord of that land, the, the owner of that land, was renting it out. So say I was the owner of the land and Cade was my steward. And I said, okay, I want $50. And Cade goes to someone, he says, the cost for you to rent this property is going to be $100. They don't know what my part is and what Cade's part is. They pay $100. But now something was going on here, and I have questions, like I said, but I believe what was being committed, would, it would be like Cade dropping his portion down or completely just knocking out his portion to where he was trying to make things right. And even someone who is a steward, someone in the Jewish mind, the Pharisaic mind, the scribe mind, who is a publican, can make things right. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Luke chapter 19. You remember who his disciples were that he was speaking to, and I want you to take notice. In Luke chapter 19, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans, and he was rich. He made his money somehow. He made his money somehow, and he sought to see Jesus and who, who he was. He could not for the press because he was a little, of little stature, and I sympathize with that man. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way, and when Jesus was come, to the place he looked up and saw and said unto him, Zacchaeus, after he saw him, he said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide in thy house or at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, This that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Now, who do we just get through noticing that he was talking to? Publicans and, and sinners, right? Take note of Zacchaeus' re response. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from, the, from, from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of of Abraham. Now I want you to take note of Luke chapter 16. After this parable of the unjust steward, what Jesus goes on to say. In verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. In short, Jesus, I believe here, was commending a good act by someone who had been doing bad. And he was trying to make things right, as Zacchaeus did, and he was striving to do. And he was cutting out his part completely or lowering his part of that which was being charged to these people. If you have any more questions on this, let me know. I'm still working my way through it. Question two, this will wake you up real quick. Uh, is being overweight or unhealthy a sin? The Bible tells us that all we have, including our Bibles, is on loan from God. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? I would really encourage you, however, for many, many, many years, I have utilized this passage almost immediately uh, in the subject of discussing drugs to my body, um, um, overeating to my body, all kinds of physical things that I can put into my body. 
And I'll be honest with you, if you look closely at 1 Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 19, and then follow that into chapter 7, I think that we're stretching a little bit to what Paul's point in this context is. And I didn't really notice that until, honestly, this weekend. Um, In the context of this passage, it's important to observe that the passage says in verse 12, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. And Paul's referring to, Uh, to what he said on multiple occasions, including verse 13, about eating meats offered to idols, things that are amoral or indifferent. The Corinthians wanted to make Christian liberty fit the idea of fornication also. If the body has sexual desires, then Christian liberty says you can fulfill them however you want to. Not so. God has rules about those things. Our being married to Jesus is a big part of this chapter and of chapter 7. And being one with his body as being married to Jesus should cause us to consider what we do with our bodies. Again, that sounds like it should fit a lot of things, but I would hasten to, I guess, caution us uh, to, to be careful about overextending the context of this passage. We are, quote, one flesh with Jesus. And if we understand, adult Christians here, what one flesh refers to, we are talking about the Uh, relationship of marriage and so sexuality is a huge part of this discussion so he says um, and and by the way we're one flesh with Jesus and that started by us being baptized into one body first Corinthians 12 and verse 13 doing sin with our bodies especially sexual sin compromises our oneness with him our bodies are for the Lord Paul says and the Lord is for our bodies first Corinthians 6 and verse 13 But does this temple of the Holy Spirit teaching extend further beyond sexual immorality? I think the principle can very loosely apply to other things, but for this context, the Spirit really wants us to see the depravity of sexual sin. In fact, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, God never gets off track in discussing something other than sexual sin in this context, so I would be careful about doing that as well. What is it about? The place where exploring sexuality is given license from God, marriage. I think it's fair to link this to the strong language of Malachi 2, verses 15 and 16, where Malachi says, But he did not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit. And why one? I'm sorry, but did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God disapproved of the priests marrying daughters of, quote, a foreign God, Malachi 2 and verse 11, affecting the trajectory of of their descendants. If you marry a foreign God, then like this context says, it would be very difficult to have, quote, godly offspring, verse 15. And it would leave God's covenant of marriage for others Um, which would evoke his wrath. We should be careful to equate a body type to sin. Body type can be the result of other health issues, such as medical, uh, of other health issues, medical treatments, or simply genetic outcomes. It doesn't have to always deal with overeating or indulgence. There is no Bible passage that says having money is sin, but many who have a lot of it will find it harder to serve God because of the temptation that comes with it, Matthew 19 and verse 24. And how easy it is to love it when you have a lot of it. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. In some instances, one's body type can lead to greater temptations to indulge in food sinfully. There is no Bible passage that says eating food in general is sin. The sin lies in indulgence. Proverbs 23 verse 21 says, For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. Even in Proverbs 30 and verse 22, where it warns of a fool being filled with food as something that makes the earth perturbed, even this isn't indicative of sin. In this instance, it's just a simple truth that people don't like fools having stuff. Indulging in anything makes us a slave to it. You can look at John 8 and verse 34, and I really encourage you, because of the lack of time, to look at Romans chapter 6 and verses 15 through 21. In verse 16 there it says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So if you submit yourself to food as a god, well, certainly you become a slave to it. In verse 19 it says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now you present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. 
So giving up an addiction to food or any other thing allows you to give up being slave, slavery to that thing and becoming a slave of righteousness. And verse 21, what fruit did you have then in those things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. People who become slaves to indulgence have a very difficult time having spiritual thoughts. And that's really the root of the whole thing. You give yourself over to something, it's hard to fill, this, fill that space anymore with God. In Isaiah 22 and verses 12 and 13, it says, And in that day the Lord God of hosts called for weeping and for mourning, for baldness and for girding with sackcloth, but instead joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating meat and drinking wine, saying, Let us eat and drink, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do you see how the absence of spiritual thought leads to the fullness of of one's own self-indulgence. Temptations of food and worldly things can keep us from seeing Christ clearly, but just simply observing someone as overweight or having a body type that does not indicate healthfulness is not itself an indication of sin. One has to look deeper into the one's mind and one's intentions in order to identify that. We're going to use something that was written and by Brother Guy in Woods, or it was in a little book that he put out many years ago called The Troubled Middle East. Now, this morning, the lesson was on one man, two sons, one seed, and many children. I had several comments on that lesson. I would like to read you something that I was intending on reading this morning, but kind of use it as a springboard to go right into the invitation this evening. Sadly, the Lord's gentle voice is neither heeded nor heard today in the land of his nativity, and the song of the heavenly host once heard by shepherds on a starlit night in Bethlehem with a glorious message of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, is heard and acknowledged in Judea no more. Instead are the shrill and angry voices of bitterness and hate, and the fearful roar of terrible weapons of death and destruction that people with the same ancestral father turn against each other. The soft moonlit skies through which the angels came near the earth with their message of love, kindness, and goodwill now echo to the piercing screams of supersonic warplanes with their lethal loads on their way to bomb Palestinian targets. The gentle murmur of waves along the sun-drenched crescent coast of the beautiful blue Mediterranean is drowned out by deadly burst of machine gun fire turned on Arab terrorists who deliberately walk into the range of the Israeli guns on the false and fatal assumption that this is, for those who thus die, the certain path to paradise. David, Israel's sweetest singer and her most beloved monarch, once a shepherd lad himself, skilled in leading his flocks to cool, refreshing waters or meadows green, and ever on guard to protect them from danger through the long and silent watches of star-studded nights in Israel's quiet valleys and along her gentle, un, uh, undiluted hills, passionately loved the land of his fathers and its capital city. And he urged his people, as he must himself have often done to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This petition seems especially appropriate today. This morning, as we considered Ishmael and Isaac, these two people, I looked at Galatians chapter 3 or, and, and really just noticed a few verses in Galatians chapter 3. If you would, please open your Bible to the book of Galatians chapter 3. And I want you to see an allegory that is found in the book of Galatians chapter 3, or chapter 4. We're going to use chapter 3 first. As we look, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, verse 7, the same are the children of Abraham. Then we moved on to verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. 
Now, what I want you to do is take note of Galatians chapter 4. And I want us to look and notice an allegory here that the inspired apostle Paul lays forth. In the book of Galatians chapter 4, let's begin, if you will, with verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond woman, the other by a free woman. Now, you know who the bond woman is? Hagar, the free woman, Sarah. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. That simply means this, through natural means or by natural means. Abraham, Abram went into Hagar, she conceived by natural means. But I want you to take note the difference. But he of the free woman was by promise. God intervened when it came to the birth, the conception of Isaac. Both Abraham as well, especially Sarah, was well beyond the years of childbearing. But God made a promise. And God intervened and kept his promise to Sarah that she was going to conceive. Isaac was a son of promise. Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. What two covenants are being spoken of? Here is a type. A type and an antitype. You have two sons and two covenants here as an allegory. You have Ishmael and you have Isaac. Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, that is Hagar. She represents, and Ishmael represents the old law. The old law of Moses was given on what mount? Sinai. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So at that point, when we look, Jerusalem still had the temple there. Jews, just like today, there are faithful Jews who reject Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. They look to Mount Sinai and they look to the old means, the old law. And that's what we still ought to go by. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free and is the mother of us all. What I would like for you to do, if you already don't have this, is a cross-reference, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. It was upon the day of Pentecost, Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, that the prophecy of this new covenant would come to fulfillment. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. Remember, he represents the new covenant, Ishmael, the old covenant. But as then he was, that he was born after the flesh, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Ishmael, Remember, mocked and made fun of and persecuted Isaac. Sarah took note of it and said, put her away. And then you have the expulsion of, of Hagar and Ishmael because of that. Paul says it's still going on today. Who was persecuting the cause of Christ at that time more than any other? Jews. Those that were trying to make the law still in effect and bind certain things such as circumcision. When you go on into Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, speaking of the law of Moses, you are fallen from grace. Paul is trying to tell them by inspiration, we're no longer under that old covenant. Here's the allegory. You have Ishmael. You have Isaac. Here's the two covenants. I want you to take note of what he says. In verse 30, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That old law 
Those, those people, those Jews were born in and bound in, uh, by that law. It was very hard to keep. When you look at, for instance, Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 4, Jesus makes mention of this. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and they do not, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders that they themselves will not move with one of their fingers. The law was hard. There was no complete forgiveness of sins either. No forgiveness of sins through that law. It was only through Jesus Christ later that the forgiveness of sins came. So Paul is saying, put out that bondwoman. Put out Ishmael. Put, that, put away that old covenant. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We're no longer under that old law, under that old covenant, under that old mosaic system. Now we're under the law of Christ. Through Isaac who came into being what law Jesus Christ came through you go back one chapter Galatians 3 16 he was the promised seed it is through Jesus that new covenant comes to fruition what's interesting to me is when you look at Isaac and when you look at Isaac in the Old Testament you'll never see this the same Isaac is a very picture a type of Christ he was when you look at chapter 22 of the book of Genesis, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. Was Isaac his only son? No, but he was his only son of promise. Guess what Jesus Christ is? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 90, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 53, Psalm 22. He is the only son of promise. He was the one that was to come into the world. Here Isaac was the only son of promise. He said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. When you go on down to verse 6, he was telling him to sacrifice him. You look at verse 6, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. What did they lay upon our Lord? The cross. The very wood that he was to be crucified on, now he fell between its weight, but for a while he bore it. And then... He took his son and he, and he laid him down on that wood. Christ was laid down on that wood. Abraham knew because of the promise of God that Isaac was that promised son by which the seed would come into the world that God had promised him that even if he did kill him, what would happen? Hebrews chapter 11, that God would what? Raise him back from the dead because God keeps his promises. Here's the type. It's not a, a complete picture of the antitype, but God did raise Jesus from the dead. When we look at Isaac and we look at Christ, and you look at Isaac, how many brides did he have? He had Rebecca. He had one bride. How many brides does the Lord Jesus have? One bride. That's the church. There's so much within these two boys, and especially Isaac, when you look at the picture of our Lord. Jesus bore the cross. He was laid out on that cross. He was crucified for our sins and sins of the world. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Here's the question of the hour or the questions of the hour. Do you believe that? We must believe. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you right now want to repent of your sins? Are you willing upon your belief to repent? We must repent. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, according to the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Upon your belief and repentance, are you willing to confess the sweet name of Jesus Christ? You know, we look this morning at those two factions, those two, those two nations that are bombing each other right now. Neither one of them 
Neither one of them would confess Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God, as a nation. Neither one of them would. But we must if we want to be saved. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, With a heart may believe in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then we must be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. If you're here this evening and you're now ready to respond to the Lord, you're now ready to be a child of God, you're now ready to be added to the bride of Christ, to the church. Or maybe that you're here and you've already obeyed the gospel, but you've strayed from the fold. Don't you think it's time that you come back to the God of heaven while together we stand in sin? Hark the gentle voice of Jesus Lord's Supper has been left prepared. If there's anyone that has not had the opportunity to partake of it, if you'll come forward at this time, you'll be served. Good evening and welcome to the Jacksonville uh, Church of Christ, thank you for being here on the Sunday evening. We just have a few announcements and reminders to go over tonight for led in a dismissal song and prayer. Um, Compassion Car Team number four will meet tonight. Um, also, Youth Devo tonight after worship. Um, the JCSC Dinner and Devo will be tomorrow night at 6.30 um, at the Student Center, and the Connellys and, and Clary Dinkins are the ho hostess. Um, the men's Bible class will meet this Tuesday at 8 a.m., as well as the ladies' Bible class will meet Tuesday at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Building. The DIG group will meet on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Visit visitation Group 4, Alan D's group, will meet uh, tonight after Bible, oh, excuse me, after a Bible class on Wednesday in the Fellowship Building. Everyone is asked to bring their favorite apple cider and cookies or false treats. Reminder that the Fall Festival at the Whitens will be next Saturday, October 28th, starting around 5 p.m. Also, the fifth Sunday fellowship will be next Sunday. Um, fried chicken will be provided. We're just asking those to bring sides and desserts. Uh, we will meet at 1.30 after that, and we'll not have a Sunday evening uh, worship. Also, the teacher resource need for this for this month has been car stock of all colors. So if you can get some of those, come out there. Also, we have plenty of those that are on our prayer list. If you if you don't if you haven't already, if you'll pick up a uh, bulletin, it has plenty of those that need to be mentioned by name and prayer. We have Patricia Summers, who's Kate Southern Summers' mom. She's recovering from surgery and needs our continued prayers. Also. Uh, the family of Carol Hagen has asked for our prayers and her declining health, so remember her. As well as Edith Shanks and Karen Tigers, they're having 
um, procedures this coming up following Tuesday. Um, continue to pray for Raffer and Mary Prater as they're both um, recovering from COVID, as well as Sandra Parker as she's uh, making improvements from um, the uh, wreck that she was in. As well as continue to remember our sick and shut ins, Leah Roper, Mary Jamison, Mary Neighbors, Harold Johnson, and Donna Williams, also those that are suffering can from cancer. That's all the announcements that I have tonight. If you have any additional announcements, remember to get them to me or those that are mentioned in the men to serve list. If you will at this time, please stand for a closing song and closing prayer. There is one more announcement. Karen Tigert is in Riverview Hospital in Gadsden, Alabama, and she is doing well. She was not doing well Friday, and um, she went in, and she's supposed to be having a heart cath, and not going to have it this, this week. Possibly, okay, but, but please keep Karen in your prayers. She is doing better, uh, but she's going to have to keep her oxygen on. The, she's on oxygen. But please keep her, if you will, in your prayers. Can you pray for her? We'll sing the first verse of 144. Blessed be the tie that binds. <clears throat> Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you have blessed us with, Father, throughout this life. Father, we thank you for this day that you have set aside for us to come together to worship you, Father. We pray that our worship this morning and this evening has been done in spirit and in truth, Father. Father, we pray for all the things that are going on in the world right now, Father. We pray for peace. We pray for wisdom for all the world. Father, be with them. Be with all of our soldiers, Father, not just ours, but everyone's, Father. We pray for all the sick and hurt and those who are having upcoming procedures, Father, be with them. Be with the doctors that are going to be uh, working on them, Father. Help them to get back to their health and be your will, Father. We pray for our congregation as we go out through this week, Father. We pray that we are a shining light to our community and that we are always pointing others to you, Father. We thank you most of all for sending your son down the cross for our sins, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 